My name is Eugene Schoen. I'm a professor here at Adams State. I'm also the gallery director. Um, I'd like to introduce two gentlemen. I think most of you probably know them since you showed up tonight. But uh, I think they've, I've had an incredible last couple days. These guys are way too funny. Uh, they pick on each other, you know, like my parents did. I mean, <laughs> they're like an old married couple. Um, the title of the show is uh, Righty Tidy Lefty Lucy, which um, when they told me that, I was kind of like, I was, why'd you name it that? <laughs> I know now. <laughs> um, it's kind of be in between these two, it's been crazy. Uh, we had a workshop last night for the students. Some of the students are here again tonight, uh, which was fabulous. Um, and one of the things when they approached me about this, coming to do a show in Lori Lasky, Alumni Association and I put it together. And um, to bring these guys back to Adam State has been really interesting. Um, we think about students that went and did good. Um, these two have done it. Uh, both are nationally syndicated cartoonists, political cartoonists, and um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves a little bit in their backgrounds. Um, but let's give them a warm welcome. <coughs> no, Piggy. I'm going to start it out. Uh, and uh, tell you about this guy that was marooned on an island. <laughs> no! <laughs> he told that twice! <laughs> no laughs. No, but this audience would understand. <laughs> the, he's marooned on an island for years and years. Navy finally picks him up. And, and uh, they talk to him, and he has three huts on this island. And the Navy guy says, well, what are these huts about? What, what's this hut about? And he says, that's where I live. And he says, what about that hut right there? And he says, that's where I go to church. And he says, this, island, this hut right here, what's that about? And he says, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> See, they understand that. <laughs> Art students are that no. <laughs> Milton and I get paid to inflict our opinions on as many people as we possibly can. And that, that'll be happening tonight. And so if some of you get mad, that's really good. And uh, if some of you like what I say, that means you're really smart. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit briefly. We, we've got 15 minutes each to, to just, and then we're going to field questions. So uh, I thought I would start out by telling you a little bit about my journey as an editorial cartoonist. And a lot of things have changed over the years. I want my wife to stand up because I've been married to her for 50 years. And uh, probably we'll get a question here, where do you get your ideas from? And I, I'll tell you, Marge gives them to me. <laughs> anyway, uh, a lot of, I, I used to be a left-wing, commie, pinko, tree-hugging <laughs> guy just like Milt, but uh, <laughs> things have changed over the years because in 1972 I had a very uh, experience, a uh, big, big experience where I came to the realization that I'm not in charge of truth. Um, truth exists whether I believe it or not, or whether I agree with it or not. It's there. And our forefathers who wrote the Constitution, I think, thought the same way. Because they started out the Declaration by saying, we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. And, uh, they talked about natural law. And what they discovered, I think, after many, many years of experience, and when they wrote those words about we're uh, created equal, I think, and I have historians that would agree with this, that they actually believe the black man had the same equal rights as he did, but many of these people had slaves. And it seems like this is, doesn't make sense. You know, did they really believe that we are created and that we're equal? 
And I, I think this is where the change kind of came over me, is understanding that I'm not in charge. Our forefathers believed that the universe existed before they came, and they had nothing to do with it. And so they saw certain things uh, reoccurring, and it was sort of a natural order of things. And so they figured there's some, something bigger out there that uh, it is happening. And I think this is where they got the idea where they wrote down the Constitution, and they did not believe in big government. Uh, they were, they didn't believe the government had authority over everything, that's why they put in the checks and balances. And so this is kind of an understanding that I have, and I'm gonna give each of you an art test a little bit to, to, to test your knowledge about this thing. But when I came to, had this big experience, uh, things really changed in my life. And uh, as it did for this guy here, who, uh, he was not special, he didn't do anything special, but he, he just started out, and all of a sudden, it was the Lord that spoke to him, and he says, he says, Abram, he renamed him Abraham afterwards, who was the spiritual father of Christians, Jews, Muslims. Did you know that? Because they go back to Ishmael as the chosen one and with the promises of Abram. But anyway, it goes back to this guy. And uh, the Lord said to him, he says, Abram, he says, I want you to leave your father's house. This is uh, in Genesis 12:3, I think. Leave your father's house. Go to a place that I will show you and be a blessing along the way. Now, if I were deciphering that and putting that into the context that I live, I would say, leave your father's house, which means to me, leave your understanding, leave your comfort zone, leave your own idea of truth and go to a place that I will show you and be a blessing along the way. So, Abram left his father's house and he went on this journey and the Lord showed him. He didn't tell him where he was going, but I think in today's context, the way I see that, is go to a place that I will show you, which is always the cross, which means to me, sacrificial love. And be a blessing along the way, and those who bless you I will bless, and those who curse you I will curse. So that was the big revelation to me that uh, helped me to understand that I'm not in charge, truth exists, and, and so if I'm going to tell people the truth in love, I need to kind of know the truth, which I don't. <laughs> but I'm getting closer. So now this comes to the point do you understand this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's... I think I'm losing my ink on that one. Here, here is something that I... Okay, tell me which sphere do you think is closest to you? A or B? Which one? A or B? B. B. <laughs> Which basketball? <laughs> A, because it's bigger. And we associate bigness with closeness. And, and so this is kind of, it's really flat, isn't it? In reality, this is just a flat surface. But in perspective, words, you would say A is closer and we understand that because if you saw a two-story building like this, you would see that these lines are kind of changed because of what we call vanishing points. And so you would say that this building would be closer than this building because of the size. Does that make sense? Okay, 
So that's the way we view things, and that's how we can fool you. Uh, artistically, I guess. Okay, here's the second question. If you were a bird, this is uh, which, which sphere would you say was closer to you now, A or B? A. A, yeah, because it's lower on the page. If you put a, a line here, you would say, yeah, A is closer because you're looking at it from a bird's eye view. If you were looking at buildings from a bird's eye view, they would look like this because of, again, perspective. Say it. Perspective. Okay, good. And so you see, this is how we relate to the nature, to the world around us. Okay, now the third question. Am I doing okay? So you got it. Okay. You're the B plus. <laughs> okay. Which sphere would be in front, closest to you? A or B? B. 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 Very good, Jack. <laughs> this is because of overlap. Even if I had a small building here and a bigger building back here, you would say that the smaller building is closer to you because of overlap. Now this is kind of the way I related. I thought when I started out cartooning, I thought I was the center of the universe. <laughs> I could make up things and I could go skewer things and I could do it based on my own opinion on things. And that has changed now because I, I still can do that, but my opinion is sometimes no good because truth exists. And sometimes it's like, uh, I, I used to think, well, this is me and this is God. So, you see, I was the center of the universe. Everything revolved around me and God was someplace in the distance. And I looked to him for guidance and everything like that. Same way with this. This would be me. And then when I, and this would be God. And now it's kind of like, it seems like I, I adjusted my living so that now this was me and this was God and we work side by side. <coughs> and now my view is very changed because I don't believe I'm the center of the universe. I believe God is the center of the universe. So now I see things as a sphere and this is God and this is me <laughs> because I'm, I'm in it. So when I draw cartoons, and I hope you can see that sometimes, I'm trying to, to draw according to what I believe to be scriptural and the truth. Go to a place that I will show you. Leave your father's house. Go to a place that I will show you, which is sacrificial and be a blessing along the way. And those that bless you, I will bless. And those that curse you, I will curse. So this is what changed in my thinking. And this is why, uh, what brought me to the idea that uh, uh, I don't have the truth on everything. But the truth exists. And my job is to tell the truth in love. And that's my view. How long have I taken? I'm doing okay? Pull it okay, out. good. Pull it out. Pull it out. Cool. Pull it out. <laughs> anyway, this is a monumental change, and you can see it in, in the drawing that I, I did out there of, of my life story. I break a lot of rules. Editorial cartoonists, when Mart, Milt and I go to the cartoonist convention, you know, Milt is, is a strong, his, his line work is strong. He, he does ideas in single panels, which is just foreign to me. And the cartoonists talk about my work, as uh, Steve Kelly said one time to uh, Benson, he says, turning now, talking about my cartoons, turning now to panel 15. <laughs> <laughs> because I can't do an idea, seems like, in a simple single panel, but sometimes I do. But, Anyway, uh, it, uh, I have a cartoon there 
that uh, no, moved over. Anyway, uh, I, I have a cartoon of a, of a black child sitting on a cloud with his angel wings and he's holding a little baby. And he says to the little baby, he says, I know how you feel. When I was down there as a slave, people didn't think I was fully human either. And every time you get into these ideas about abortion, gay rights, whatever, you're going to stir up opposition. A lot of people really get mad. And when they get mad, uh, they might call me up and they would say, Chuck, you're an idiot. And, and I would say to them, well, I'm not the brightest bulb in the newsroom, I know that. And, and I said, but, you know, I just have this world view that people are people, no matter how small I'm quoting. Uh, another editorial cartoonist. What's his name, Nils? What was the quote again? The quote, a person is a person, no matter how small. It's the same guy that was living in the hot tub. <laughs> Dr. Seuss. Dr. Oh, yeah, and, and so that's that's my philosophy, and that's what I'm trying to do: is warn the idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everybody. That's my job description. And I see that <laughs> you see I'm done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and just wait for some more. Help. See, Melt, it was all a matter of perspective. Okay. Exactly. Thank you for coming here. We're going to have a, a continue to have a great time. I got 15 minutes to show you some of my favorite cartoons, but we're really here to answer any other questions. So as soon as the, I'm showing my cartoons, then we're going to take it, open it up for a little bit of Q and A. So hit the on button. Oh no, we hit no, the. No, no, just go full screen. Play, just play and. Play slideshow. Yeah. You'll leave it right there for right now. A year ago, Chuck and I started planning this event. And the reason we started about it, wanted to plan this event, because for decades, literally decades, Chuck and I talked about doing this actual event. And forgive me, but I am losing it that this is the actual moment that we have been planning. <laughs> and a year ago, on the way home, after planning this with Lori Lasky and, and uh, Gene Schilling, I stopped up in Castle Rock to see my old teacher and advisor, Cloyd Snook. And Cloyd asked me, so, where are you living these days? And I said, Oak Harbor, Washington, knowing that he would not know where the hell that is. <laughs> and he says, oh, I know exactly where you live. And I said, what? He said, oh, yeah, I was stationed at Whitby Naval Air Station which was literally four miles from my house. And I just could not believe that. I was just in shock. He was having a blast. He was just laughing at me because I was in, in shock. And I'm going to turn it back to him now because I, my brother was a nuke. He was in the Navy. Nuke, which is short for nuclear engineer. He ran the sub. The name of the sub was the USS Snook. <laughs> That's right. The snook. That's the truth because my brother saw the invite that you guys saw and it said the snook gallery. And my brother, hey! You should teach her name after our son? What's going on? <laughs> so, who do I draw cartoons for? This S will be right here. This is who I draw. This is all, the Gutenberg era of the print world has come to an end. 500 years. It's been a good run, but it's over. Okay. <laughs> Tesla is taking over. Everything is going electronic. <laughs> Appliances, cars, television, all the media now is going electronic. It's electric. This is Tesla. Gutenberg was the past. That's where Chuck and I live, in the Gutenberg <laughs> press area. So I'm going to show you some of my favorite cartoons, but I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I have actually heard this people actually said, what is a pretty? What is that? In high school, a girl came up to me in, in art staff class 
and said, hi, my name's so-so, what's your name? And I said, not pretty. She said, oh, no, no, really, what is it? <laughs> that is my name, that's my given name. A lot of people think I made that up to be a, a cartoonist because we all have AC, have you ever heard of it? AC? <laughs> <laughs> In the cartoon world, there's an elephant, there's a Zep, S-Z-E-P, um, you know, and pretty, what, what the hell is a pretty? So, um, it's been a fun name. That's where I developed the thick skin. Grow up with that kind of a name. See what kind of profession you guys end up in. Okay. People ask me, how long have you been drawing cartoons? Or drawing? I can say, here's, here's photographic evidence. I've been drawing for 59 years. <laughs> right here, earliest photo that I could find of me with paper, with pencils of paper. That's my mom and my little brother. I wrestled here at Adams State. This is the year before Craig Kelso came to Adams State, who was a, was a teammate of ours in 75. This is 1974. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Where am I from originally? I was born in Anchorage, Alaska at a very early age. Grew up in Chicago, went to the JC at the Western Burbs of Chicago. The coach Ulrich then recruited me here to Adams State. The funny thing about that, which a lot of people may not know, is that before Coach Ulrich at Adam State here called me up, I was getting mail from Western State. <laughs> because a lot of the wrestlers from my JC had gone to Western State, they told them about me, blah, blah, blah. So I was receiving all this mail from Gunnison. But I never got on the phone. Ulrich then got a hold of me, and I got here. This is the Rocky Mountain Conference Championships in Golden. <laughs> and Cloyd might remember this. Well, I know what you guys are looking at. This is 74. I broke my neck at the Colorado State uh, National Freestyle Finals, second round. You're all looking at the brace. What I'm looking at, and this is where I'm getting points with my advisor, Mr. Snook. There I am doing my homework. There he is. <laughs> See this? That is my independent study. I have photographic proof that I was doing my drawing independent study that he had me working on. There's the team that's being inducted to the Adams State uh, Athletic Hall of Fame later this month. And there's Craig Kelso. Here's Craiger. And there's me. And so that team's going in, along with the 76 team. Here's some of my favorite cartoons. I love doing locals. Locals because that's like you're calling in the, the artillery right into where you are. Okay, and so I was the cartoonist at the Spokesman Review, which is just to the side there of that swastika. The Aryan Nations, that was Hayden Lake, and they were giving Northern Idaho a really bad reputation. So I, I just stated that, I called it a rough change around, instead of a diamond in a rough, I turned it a rough into a diamond. Just so happens that Idaho is called the Gem State. So at least, where do you get your ideas from? I tell you, I got the best writers in the world. I got Bush, I got the Clinton, I got the Aryan Nations, the, the neo-Nazis. They write the material for me. I march down the hill after the battle and shoot the wounded. That <laughs> that fucking job. So, um, again, this was the local publisher in Coeur d'Alene. He owned the Coeur d'Alene Resort. This is Dwayne Hagedone. And uh, the caption is, you're crazy. Lake Coeur d'Alene doesn't have a sea serpent. When this cartoon appeared, all hell broke loose. The next day, the editor came in. He says, I, I, gotta write, I have to write an apology for this cartoon. It's got to run in tomorrow's paper. Help me with this. Why did you draw this cartoon? So um, I told him, and he says, okay. I, so I also told him, I said, don't do it. Don't apologize. Do not embarrass you, yourself, the newspaper, me, the publisher. And he says, the publisher's the one who told me to apologize. I got my working orders. I have to do this. I said, okay. So it ran, and the day after the apology ran, my phone rings in the office. I pick up, no, pretty speaking. And, and he says, I hear a voice say, we're sending the Calvary. <laughs> and I said, hello, who is this? This is Bill Hall from the Lewiston Tribune. We're sending in reinforcements and attacking that horrible apology excuse for an explanation of the humor. And we're running your cartoon when we're not paying anybody. We're, you're going to attack the, the editorial? 
apology? And he says, damn right. I said, go get him. <laughs> and again, this is what the neo-Nazis are doing to northern Idaho. There is a race in Spokane called the Bloomsday race, and it's like a 12K race, but it's so popular they have one for the little kitties. And they call it Junior Blooms Day. So I have, I showed here the uh, starting line of Junior Blooms Day, and I have one kid saying to the other, did you see the kids from Idaho? And the KKK little hat. <laughs> the place went bonkers. <laughs> they, uh, local, one of the local car dealerships called for a boycott of the newspaper. He bought a full page ad which cost like ten, fifteen thousand dollars and he just had a little note there. If you were offended by no pretty cartoon, da 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 date, please boycott the newspaper. Obviously he sold all the cars he wanted to sell. <laughs> so what is this? When they hire me as folks to review that the editor said, we want a cartoonist that will create a community buzz. I want this paper so popular because of the cartoonist that people are buying the newspaper just to see what the cartoonist drew. And I said, I guarantee I'm your man. I'll, I'll do that for you. And it happened because of those, those cartoons I just showed you. And then the newspaper said, okay, we got the community buzz. Now it's time to cash in. And they printed up these bumper stickers, started giving them out free, handing it, and the people were putting on the bumper stickers, and people were saying, what's a pretty? <laughs> And, but you know, you can't please everybody every day with every cartoon. You can't. It's impossible to do that. So that's why they printed up these. <laughs> and they handed these out too. I had both on my car at the same time. <laughs> you got to have a little bit of ESP. Look, it's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's Russell Wilson. I live up in Seattle right now. And this is a year before the Super Bowl. I know we got a little Broncos here, Broncos fan, but here is it. He had won uh, in the Pro Bowl, and here's the part for ESP. Oh, next year is going to be something. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> yes, ESP, that stands for Extra Smart Priggy. That's what that is. <laughs> Speaking of Extra Smart Priggy, Ebola virus, political chaos, poverty, and anarchy in Zaire. So what? Right here. 1995. 14 years ago. I drew the cartoon. 14 years. Oh, this is a fun part. You see the little caricature way at the top? I made friends with an Egyptian cartoonist. I did a caricature of him. He loved it so much, he made it part of his signature. <laughs> in the upper left hand corner. You see it? <laughs> and so now every time he puts he draws a cartoon. He puts my caricature of him on his own cartoon and then posts it on Facebook and I got these funny Egyptian cartoons that I don't understand <laughs> showing up on my Facebook page. There it is, there's another one. So somebody can come to my Facebook page and probably think I'm Egyptian or something. Ah, now for a killed cartoon. You mean they kill your cartoons? Yeah. I can draw anything I want, they can reject anything I draw. I work for them, they don't work for me, okay? It's their newspaper. This is one of my favorites. This is comparing Iran Contra with Watergate. That's it. And I love this, car this cartoon so much because you know it's Reagan and you see it from the back. <laughs> and, and the editor said this would confuse the readers. I said, really? Okay. <laughs> okay, now. Have you ever been sued for libel? Yes. <laughs> I have. Most cartoonists go, how many times have you been sued, Chuck? Man. Have you, who else has been sued besides me? Oh, uh, Sydney Wilson's the latest. Oh boy, she's got one, right? Yeah. I've had three. <laughs> three libel lawsuits. And to show you how, how well or how bad people do not even know what an editorial cartoon is, out of those three libel lawsuits, two are by judges. The judges are right next to you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and here's, here's the kicker. The third one, you all enjoy this prayer. The third one's from a wrestling coach. <laughs> oh, back to what is this? This this just illustrates a feud. Chief Justice Celebrezzi was having a feud with the Ohio Bar Association, which is the lawyers. 
and he called them a bunch of skunks. That's the reason the skunk is here. Remember I said I have the best writers in the world? Why would you put a skunk in there? Well, the Chief Justice called them a bunch of skunks. They're having a feud. Celebrate I'm not going to draw Hatfields and McCoys, okay? So as soon as I heard about the feud, this is what I thought. So this is, this is weird. This is really weird. You should have been at the deposition. Their lawyer, that, and I'm like, I'm like 28 at the time. The lawyer says, in the deposition, it went on for eight hours. Eight hours of asking inane questions. <laughs> inane questions like, Mr. Priggy, have you ever known Chief Dustin Celebrizzi ever to fire a machine gun? <laughs> so I looked at my lawyers, I had, I had three lawyers, I said, he doesn't, he thinks it's a photograph. <laughs> he doesn't know what a cartoon is. We got $12 million lawsuit depending on this lawyer who thinks this is a photograph. And my lawyers kept saying, just calm down and answer the question. <laughs> you know, don't care. You know, because there's a stenographer right there on the side going, this is great, you know. And I said, no, I've never known the Chief Justice ever to fire a machine gun. It gets better. That was the setup. That's not the punchline. Mr. Priggy, have you ever known Chief Justice Celebrezzi ever to fire a machine gun from a passing automobile? <laughs> the man is a literalist. I don't know how he became a lawyer. He did not know what a cartoon was. And he should have heard my mom. Milty, $12 million? You don't know. Where are you going to get $12 million? I said, Mom, don't worry. I'm not going to lose. I'm never going to lose. I'm never wrong. <laughs> Really, can an opinion be wrong? And if so, whose opinion is going to be wrong? And even more importantly, who is going to say your opinion is wrong? It's an opinion. You have to remember that. There's always two sides of the story. Never let the facts get in the way of a good cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> and um, get to the next cartoon. Ah, George. You, the president is not going to see my cartoons in Spokane, Washington, unless he comes to visit. When he comes to visit, because our, con uh, our congressman is Tom Foley, who is Speaker of the House. So he's coming to Spokane. I, and I don't really uh, believe in him being called the environmental president. And so I drew that. And I should have shown this to the editor. I said, no way. We're not going to slap the president's face the very day he comes to Spokane. I said, why not? <laughs> He says, we're not going to do it. That's killed cartoon. Ah, hillbillies, wetbacks, crowds, japs, spades, redskins. Hey, thank you. That's exactly, the, that's exactly what I wanted. And the editor said, no way, that's racist. I said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I said, we're going to use this, right? He says, no. And I said, why not? He says, it's racist. I said, yeah, that's why I drew the cartoon. Now, why aren't we using it? And he says, it's racist. You said that. You know, this is an inane argument. So he says, I got a problem with this, 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 this. And I said, yeah. And he says, I just told you, I got a problem with this, 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 this. And he never said this. So I said, you proved my point. The whole very reason for the, the reason of the purpose of the cartoon even existed. You've explained it. You know, what are we talking about here, ladies and gentlemen? We're talking about skin. We're talking about the color of skin. We have distilled the very essence of racism and made it the name of a protein. And here's the kicker. We don't even know it. We don't even recognize it. And by the very fact that he killed it, proved it. And here's the best part. That was in 88, and then the last games were in the Super Bowl again in 91. So I got the cartoon out again. I submitted it. Yes! Have you changed your mind? Have you grown any, Mr. <laughs> Editor? Have you realized the wrong way of your world there? And he says, no, I didn't. It's still killed. So it's, and that was done back in 88. So that's a killed cartoon. And here's one of my favorite cartoons. I showed this to the editor. The editor just, um, <laughs> you can't slam Christians on the most holy, oh, originally, I should back up, this originally said, Happy Easter. Uh, and he said, you can't slam Christians, well, I don't know why he's thinking I'm slamming them. You can't slam Christians on the most holiest of all holidays? What are you doing? Are you crazy? Are you? I saw a little red line going right up his, right up his, I thought he was going to have a heart attack, you know, because the steam started coming out of his ears. 
you know? And I said, okay, calm down, calm down, we'll edit. And when you say edit to an editor, it's like throwing a cat to a cat. <laughs> oh boy, we can edit? Yeah, and I said, yeah, we can edit. And the red line started going down like a water cartoon. I thought, I had to save the mm -hmm. kid's life. You know, so I said, look, look, we'll take off Happy Easter. How's that, huh? We'll take off Happy Easter and we'll run it on Saturday. And he goes, oh, okay, good. Okay, yeah, we can, we can do that. Okay, yeah. So it's okay to sign the Christians on the day before the Most Holy is all in, but not on the day of. Funny thing is, I, I was going, I was a member of Whitworth Presbyterian Church up there in Spokane, and Sunday, Easter Sunday, I'm going through, we're leaving church, going down the aisle, I'm going to go shake the hands of the pastor. He knows what I do, and he sees my face, and I go up to shake hands, and he, he says, great cartoon yesterday, but why didn't it run Friday? <laughs> Good Friday, the day Jesus died. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, he's right. He's absolutely right. The pastor's right. But the editor made sure, you know, we didn't have it on either day. It was on Saturday. Because he was all concerned about getting people upset. And here's the mail I got for that cartoon. World Christian Encyclopedia 1980 lists 20,780 different Christian denominations. I only had 32. <laughs> I went to the yellow pages and you just listen to them. And then he also writes, I do not wish to be identified with any religious organization. I have never seen anything so revealing in this confused world. Keep it up. So that made my day and that's always making my speeches. Oh, this one you'll love. Let me back up. Gary Locke, the governor of Washington State. Patty Murray, senator. And you're going to love this. You're going to love this. Oh, and Hanford is the nuclear power reactor. Okay? That's what, and it's being restarted. So Gary and Patty in the Evergreen State. And he said, that's not getting in. I said, why? What's wrong with it? And, uh, and that one ran. This one didn't. This one ran, this one didn't. What's the difference, gang? <laughs> what? <laughs> Boobies. <laughs> so, Mr. Editor, are you are you saying the cartoon won't run because Patty Murray has breasts? And he says, yeah. I said, well, doesn't she? <laughs> Five years of college. This is the debate we're having if a female has breasts or not. And if the cartoon's getting in the paper or not. They aren't that big. <laughs> <laughs> not now. So I went ahead and I changed it. I erased, I erased the booby lines and it ran. I don't know if he had a problem with breasts or Patty Murray or what. So, so that's... <laughs> Casey Kasem, you might, you guys might know who Casey Kasem is, a radio DJ, and his wife kidnapped him, took him to Kitsap County up there in the, the Puget Sound area, Kitsap County. Just so happens I work for the Kitsap Sun, which is out of Bremerton, Washington, and they were having a big argument, and the editor said, we can't run this. I said, why not? Well. When I drew this, turned it in, Casey Kasem was on his deathbed. He hadn't had water or food for five days. This is Friday. And I said, this is for Sunday paper. I really don't think he's going to last much longer, and I don't think he's going to recover. So, so that's the... Um, I'm going to pull up the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what didn't run. But this is what did. He wanted them in there. And ironically, no, no previous ESP, he... Um, he died the very day the cartoon came out. So, wow. so the editor embarrassed himself, whereas if he would have gone with that, this is more of a non sequitur, a voice coming from a coffin, because usually voices don't come from coffins. So, but this is what he wanted. So now everybody's, now instead of looking at the, the, the women arguing, the mother, the stepmother, and the daughter arguing, now we're looking at Casey Case in there. So it, it's a, you know, the editor will separate the wheat from the chafe and print the chafe, so there it is. <laughs> There's proof. Ah, sarcasm! Freedom is the right to tell people something they don't want to hear. And I tell you, I was just really upset sending soldiers to a war they shouldn't have been bigger. 
and seeing seeing those reunions where the parent, where the little children run up to the parents and jump up into the arms. So I want to, as Chuck AC says, I want to inflict my opinion on as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. Nuclear waste. See, if you don't, I have to, as a cartoonist, I have to assume that you're just as smart and just as stupid as I am. If you do not know what this, this ring is, you're not going to get the cartoon. It's going to be fly right over your head, and it's going to be a joke about huts and guys and where they used to live. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is very interesting because marijuana laws have been passed now in Colorado and Washington State. So this so this will work even in, Washington, in Colorado. And this is a reefer relativity. It's a takeoff of the M.C. Escher print. Ah, Portland. Uh, there's a very famous bookstore up in Portland, uh, uh, Portland, Oregon. It's called Powell's Bookstore. And that character over on the far side over there, that's me. I was walking by that bookstore, and I turned around and I looked in. That's what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get your ideas? I got the best writers in the world. And I just turned around, and that's what I saw. And I looked around back to the street, and I looked. Does anybody see what I see? Do you see Gutenberg coming to an end and Tesla taking off? There it is. Ray Rice. Now this is why I draw cartoons. Words and form, pictures move. Okay? We knew that Ray Rice knocked out his wife. Okay? We saw him in the first video that he's dragging around and okay, she he's the he's He's you know, barred for two games, suspended from two games. Uh, everything on the or you know, that's it. What life goes on, you know. Then the video of him clocking his wife, and uh, that visual image, that visceral image, says, "We are upset." The Ravens say, "You're off. You're out of here." The NFL says, "You're not signing with any other team." Why? Because did somebody write a little editorial saying, oh, that you shouldn't hit your, your wife to be. No, we saw a video of a man knocking a woman out cold. And by seeing that, the NFL says, well, we never saw the tape. We never saw the tape. And, and, you know, and now all these other domestic violence things are coming out. So the visual is like a hand grenade. The editorial is like a little sniper's bullet, a sniper's gun with a silencer on it. So the cartoon, the visual cartoon is a grenade that goes off with lots of shrapnel going out. And it's going to hit Goodell, it's going to hit other domestic violence. It's even going to hit Hope Solo, the soccer building for the U.S. women's soccer team. And now we're going to talk about double standards, because she has a domestic violence charge hanging over her head, and but she's not suspended from her soccer team. So. A cartoon is a simple machine to make the reader think. Chuck, how are we doing on time? I think we're over. Oh boy! <laughs> Best cartoons are the ones with the least amount of words. Why? Because you're lazy. You don't want to read. That's work. And we exaggerate. Chuck and I, we exaggerate because we have three to five seconds to get my, our message across to you. If, if, if the more I make you read, the greater chance I have of losing you as a reader. There's not too many. All the red is where there are no staff editorial cartoonists left in America. The pink, they have one staff editorial cartoonist in that state. So again, this just illustrates the end of Gutenberg in the printing press. And now we're going to be taking off with Tesla. Those print people all have to die off first because they've just been, for the last 50 years, they've been trying to cut their way out of the newspapers going down. Meaning they've been shooting holes in the bottom of the boat to let the water up. <laughs> it's not working. So, who's got a question? All right. You got a question? You got a question there, sir? I have a question. Uh, how do you see this working out, uh, Milt, as far as your hope is concerned? How, how, how do you see us, do you see us getting better as a nation or are we in trouble? Yes, 
<laughs> both, both. It's a transition time. As one, as one medium's going down, the other one's you know, coming up. And our world is, is changing. And I get, how do I get rid of this? Did you turn that off here? Just get rid of the lights. There. there. Okay. Yeah. So, so do you think it's going to get better? Optimistic or pessimistic, generally? As soon as all the print people die out, you know, as soon as the print people, because they're still, they've been made, the demographics for mass media have been changing, and it's been continually changing uh, over these last five decades. And selective. And selective, exactly. So it's just been, it's been going that way, and um, it's a whole brand new world. So, questions, anything at all? Yes, right there. Um, well, okay, so, all right, so my name is Malcolm Jones. I'm a graphic design emphasis. And do you feel like the whole aspect of political cartoons and print can change in a way of graphic design taking over? In a, like, like political cartoons used through graphic design? Because you brought up this whole thing about the print dying down. No, it's not dying down, it's dead. It's, just <laughs> it's dead, and, and I'm going to get to you right there, but what I want to say is it's it's dead the profession of editorial cartooning has been dead because the very foundation of its, its existence is gone it's found and it, what is that foundation competition most newspapers most cities only have one newspaper they don't have to compete with anybody well, where else are you going to go you know that's it the art of cartooning graphic expression will live forever we have been painting on cave walls up to this day for 30,000 years. It's not going to go anywhere. Okay? So it's, and, and your question about graphic design. Graphic design. It's all a brand new game. As we're coming down now, now we have an opportunity to recreate mass media. So, yes, graphic design may come into it. Editorial cartoonists are now moving over to the animation world. Like okay. how the, uh, the design set up by Harris, uh, you know, the visual of the guy in the black suit with the knife and the guy kneeling in the red suit. Just, just think of how that changed our country as far as involvement. And it, it, that's huge. And that was a visual that uh, uh, really caught the attention. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about, I think. There's an, there's an arm up here. Yes? Um, I know Chuck has gotten some death threats. Have you gotten any death threats? Yeah, the conservatives hate me just as much as the liberals hate him. <laughs> Most of them came from me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, but when people get uh, phone in a death threat, you know, they are just extremely upset. They want to they wanna spew, and usually that's the last you see of them. Except for one time for me at the Spokesman Review in Spokane, Washington, I realized um, I was in the foyer there upstairs in the newsroom, and I realized I was talking to the guy that had just called up to say that he was going to get me, and he had a he had a trench coat over his arm oh. like this, and I was I was I was concerned. <laughs> and he had a trench coat over here, and and he was and I was standing there, and I was uh, I was saying if his hand goes in there. I'm tackling him. I don't care. You know, I don't care what he gets up, brings out. You know, but there was, there was this big trench coat over here, and he was in there. You know, you know, and I realized, oh my God, this is the same guy. And and, and so the other people were there. So and after that, they, they, the administration told me, anytime you get a call like that, tell us. So I think I've gotten more death threats because I'm a little. Chubbier and, and Mel is a full bore wrestler on a uh, full ride scholarship guy. I wouldn't threaten him. Uh, no, I, I really do think that uh, uh, when you get a death threat, if, if you get a death threat, Benson has had so many. Uh, he lives in a conservative area. Yeah, and, and I think that that kind of shows uh, the power of, of the cartoon. And, uh, but uh, we haven't had anybody killed recently, but if you, <laughs> if you were cartooning in the Middle East, your friend yeah. from Egypt, uh, yeah, the, we there. get lots of that. Yeah. Somebody also asked the other day, what about the entertainment factor of your cartoons? And um, 
if you agree with the cartoons, they're very entertaining. But if you don't agree with them, and I am ridiculing your sacred cow, it's not going to be that entertaining for you. Mm -hmm. The entertaining aspect, when I was drawing cartoons in Spokane, is we usually printed all the hate mail. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the radio DJs, the breakfast boys at KZZU, whatever, they would get the newspaper and they would read all the letters on the air and just to get laughs. And that's where the entertainment, because they couldn't believe how stupid these letters were, and they would be reading all the letters. So I was creating material for these uh, the breakfast boys on the radio. So uh, where do you get your ideas from, Chuck? <laughs> My Marge. <laughs> I get my ideas uh, probably the same areas you do. You read, you check your pulse. If something gets you going, then you start uh, thinking, and then you turn ideas around in your head. And if they're advancing, you know your ideas uh, are advancing out, and then they they gel. Uh, you got a cartoon idea. Sometimes they come fast. Sometimes they don't come. And and when I see myself thinking in a circle like this and coming back to the same place and it's not funny or not poignant or something, then you just leave that issue and maybe some other time. Some of my ideas come from just, uh, I think later weeks, years later, they come. What Chuck is trying to say is, we get awfully funny at 4.30 in the afternoon, right before deadline time. All of a sudden, the idea is yeah. Oh, and to, uh, to illustrate and underline what I mentioned about Gutenberg coming to an end, I graduated here from 76. I went to Chicago, started freelancing for the Chicago Daily News until 18 months later, it went under. So then I moved to Dayton, Ohio, and I started working for the Journal Herald until it went under. <laughs> then I moved to Spokane, Washington and started drawing cartoons there until the Spokane Chronicle went under. Do you so, see his chain? <laughs> <laughs> it's not me! It's not me! When you studied at Adams State, were the, did you study what I would call traditional art? and then become a cartoonist or with Capitan at the same time. Did you have to take fiber play and metal? <laughs> yeah, get that in there. Uh, we are both fine art majors. Here's the funny thing is we're cartoonists now. When people look to the editorial page, they're, they think that Chuck and I are experts on politics, math, geoeconomics, <laughs> uh, war, peace, uh, ethics, religion. Okay, yeah, we're religion. Uh, <laughs> we're art majors. You know, so yes, we took all the classes that we had to take to get our our, our BA in, in fine art, and I did. I loved I loved the art department here so much. I didn't even bother with a minor, so I had an expanded major in art, and none of it was really in fiber clay metal. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the closest Milk came to science uh, understanding was when he was sweeping the floor in the science room. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Forty years ago, I was working in this very building, sweeping the floors, washing the blackboard, <laughs> the, 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 you know, lining up the desks. That was my, uh, yeah, my study job. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it was right here in this, in this very building. When I realized 40 years later, I'd be sharing stuff with you guys. Question? Anything at all? Yes! So it's clear that political cartoons can fire us up and get our attention. Do you feel that the work you do actually elevates the discourse that we have in an increasingly kind of coarsened and partisan uh, country? So yes. So yes. Yes. Do you believe that the present manic depressive element found in modern literature, due to the unsuppressed realm of ultra conscious mysticism, which has resulted in the atavistic heroes motivated by so called brain impulses? And he's not a Because we provoke 
We're provoking people to start debating. And if I get somebody a little upset in a cartoon, what are they doing? They're like, they gave me the cartoon. Look what he drew. Can you believe it? Look at this. And they're like, well, it's not that bad. He says, well, what do you mean it's not that bad? We're the peers. I don't know if you guys remember the commercial where the guy says, he says it tastes filling. This guy says it tastes great. And you get out and then you get those two people arguing. So that's what we're doing is we're getting people discussing. It's when we're discussing these issues that we're going to propel our society in the right direction where we all want to go. But when we're not talking about it, that's when Sarah Palin is going to come in and take over. <laughs> 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 I've got a draw off plan. What do you think? This is called an ambush. <laughs> oh, gracious. So while we're waiting for that, anybody have any questions? Anything else at all about Adam State? I have a comment. You know. Yeah, right. I uh, remember you drew a cartoon for the paper. Do you remember when you got chewed out by Coach Ulrich? Yes, I remember when I got, <laughs> Coach, I got chewed out by Coach Ulrich. And the cartoon, the original, is down in the show. <laughs> you guys want to know about it real quick? Yeah. There was uh, the, uh, what was the group? The King Club. No, 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 it was the Spurs. The Spurs. The Spurs, uh, it was very difficult to get a class because uh, once the classes are filled up, you, know, you may not get into that whatever class that may be. So the athletic director, the basketball coach, with the help of the Spurs, uh, female service organization, let the basketball players in early. So I, uh, so I showed that. Because I, that's what I, you know, there was a little scandal about it. People, kids were upset, you know, because we're all treated, treated equal to be getting in there to register for class. So I drew the, the... What was the caption? The key to registering early is the key. <laughs> 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 well, I'll tell you. When you're on full ride, athletic ride, and, and you're, you know, this is what I, this is what I really got my first heat. My coach grabs me like this. Come here. <laughs> what the hell are you doing? What the hell are you doing with that card? You, you're on our side, damn it. What the hell are you doing? It was still the hippies and the docks and, you know, and still all of that kind of, you're on scholarship here. What the hell are you doing? And, um, and, and I said, I, I drew a cartoon. I know you drew a cartoon, you know. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm going to lose my scholarship. Oh my God, I'm not going to graduate and all stuff like that. And he, and he took me out of the wrestling room and he took me into the other part of the gym in Pocky Hall. And, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you know, and I said, this, isn't this true? It don't matter if it's true, you're on scholarship, you're on our side. You know? <laughs> And I just like you know stood there and, 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 and took it all that out of you know. So and that's when I learned the lesson. But that's what's so great about school is that it gives you an opportunity to make mistakes. <laughs> You've always been a renegade. Yeah. <laughs> well I brought two gorgeous models in for you tonight. So Mr. Snook, would you please come down forward? Da -da 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 -da. And Doc Cotton, would you mind sitting there? So you can do whatever you want to them. <laughs> here. there we go, there we go. Oh, and by the way, the winner gets the other's check. No, they don't fall down. Gets the oh, Adam's yeah. pig. All oh, right. Oh, winner uh, Jack. So I don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted you to get some. <laughs> so I've got. To, I've got to say something. Yes. The last time he drew a caricature of me was when we asked him to make the spring brochure for sports when I was the AD. Remember that, Chuck? I thought it was when you were still playing for the NBA. <laughs> they didn't make caricatures. They All made right. Are you gentlemen ready? Okay, what are we doing? We're going to do a caricature, both of them together, however you want to do it. 
Yeah, this is just like life drawing class. Oh, yeah. Do yeah. 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 a 15 second pose. Ready? Go. Do you, do you want to make it? <laughs> do they get all oh, life drawing? <laughs> all right, sir. All right, here we go. All right. <laughs> I, I think you gave me the bad marker. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> This is Floyd right here. Got a pot. And this is going to be you. See, the funny thing is, I always drew Mr. Snook from the back. <laughs> <laughs> you can always make something funny by just dropping a ball on their head. <laughs> Thank you again for coming.